Hi there, welcome to the Mini Sculpting Super Show. I'm your host, Tom Mason, and normally we talk about sculpting miniatures, showing techniques, but we are back, I'm back here today with another edition of the Sculpting Archives. This time, I'm gonna show you uh, the works that I did during 2005. Now, you know, this year comes after the first year that I was really, felt like I was really getting in the industry, and, and um, I kept working with Magnus and Egos, and it was a good time, I loved it, but I really didn't have a lot of output. You know, I, I had taken on a full-time job, my son had been born, so I was still happy with what I got out, but it's just so funny to look back and see how, you know, the amount of work you do and, and the output you have will change depending on your life circumstances. But don't get discouraged by that, you know, just keep working, keep sculpting, and you'll get there. You'll improve. And that's probably the best, best thing about this year for me was that the four figures I did for Magnus and Egos, well, one was just a conversion, but I learned a lot. And I think they are still today some of my nicest sculpts. You know, I'm better in a lot of ways, but I just, I really started to refine and get a handle on doing details and, and things like that. And I'll talk about that in the episode when you see, but anyways, uh, let's get on with it. The Mini Sculpting Super Show is powered in part by Sculptomo Toys. See everything they have to offer at SculptomoToys.com. Galatius Aquatinus, half orc centurion. This is my third sculpt I ever did for Magnificent Egos, and for years, I mean years, this, I considered this like my best sculpt. Uh, there were a lot of challenges with this guy. For instance, he has the exact same two Gladius swords, and I did not have access to casting, didn't think of it as an option, and so I sculpted both of them separately and tried to get them as close to identical as possible. And I think they basically are. I mean, you can see a little bit of variation in the pommels, but essentially they're the exact same weapon. But I poured over this miniature for hours and hours and hours. The amount of details that I stuck on this guy compared to what I did, well, th in this phase of my life, I was putting, trying to force in as much detail. Like I was, I can't remember if, if Rackham was out yet, but uh, in confrontation, but when those came out for sure, it was an incredible inspiration, and I just tried to pack in as much fine little detail as possible. You can even see here, let's see, it's on this one, you see a little bit on the thumb, there's a thumbnail, his uh, hands wrapped around so there's not really as much room to show fingernails, but I put thumbnails on there, I put toenails on this guy, not to mention all the little tidbits on the armor, things like that. But yeah, I kept this guy in my portfolio and showed him off for several, several years. I was very proud of this. I still, I still really am. The only thing I always was a little bit, I didn't care for was not the face or anything, not the head, but, but the head, I guess I'd say. Just uh, probably more to do with the hairdo and stuff. Uh, not that there was anything wrong with it. This was based off the concept art, and I just always thought this guy would look cooler if he had like longer hair, ponytail. I know it didn't fit the theme because he's supposed to be like a Roman officer, fantasy Roman officer, but I just always thought it was kind of missing something. Like I wanted something to fill in that gap. It looked kind of silly to see such a cool, dynamic character, but have him be almost too proper looking in my mind. Maybe a helmet would have been nice, but this was the concept I was given, and uh, all in all, I really like it. This cape for me was a super big challenge. This was the first time, I think it was the first time that I ever did a cape, and I wanted it to be dynamic and interesting, but as you can see, it's a little, it's a little fudged here, because this part's really short, this part's really long. I did that to help with uh, molding and casting, but Obviously, if this cape was really as big as I've done it, this part would come out much further. It still looks pretty cool and it's pretty dynamic, but when you when you whoop, when you look at it and think about it, it's uh, it's just a little silly. But but yeah, this guy had a lot of pieces and bits too because of the two swords. He had two scabbards. 
those also had to be the same and just there was a lot of uh, precision with this miniature that I hadn't had to do uh, as much but I was really trying to still make my game at this point I had been I had met Bobby Jacks and well I had already met a lot of these sculptors and they were all doing such great work and I got to see their stuff up close and just how detailed and interesting it was and I knew that I had to try give it everything I had to come anywhere close to what these guys were doing and girls yeah Sandra Garrity Julie Guthrie just name a few another sculpt for Magnificent Egos this is Angro the Dwarf Barbarian I don't know if I've mentioned it already but a lot of these concepts and characters that we were doing for Magnificent Egos they were based on Chris Clark and his friends and partners a lot of their D&D characters so um, you know, this guy's a little less out there, but he has a lot of specific character to him. For instance, I don't remember... I, there was something very special about this this helm. It was like he, he got it off of some very specific creature. It wasn't fashioned for him, I believe. Uh, but there was a story behind that. And this was, <laughs> this was a tough piece to do, um, but a lot of fun. I've packed in a good amount of intricacy on the helmet, and I really was happy that I was able to get such dimension on these horns but still make it castable because it would come in this way and you would have the mold plane hit those there wouldn't be any spike behind another spike or anything like that um, and this is where I started to learn how to do axes as well which uh, were always fun and interesting um, but this guy I really liked the musculature that I did on him however the funny thing is uh, as much as, you know, Chris Clark always liked my sculpts and um, was very encouraging. But uh, when I did this one, I remember a very specific comment that he told me so. He, he really liked the anatomy I did and the musculature, but he thought that for him personally, I'm sure he didn't put it this way, but for him personally, he did not like how cut I made the guys. Like, it's a little tough to see, but you can, but you can tell that just how... I mean, the model, the muscles are cut, you know, there, there's, there's dif very definitive lines and angles, uh, which I actually always thought was cool. It made it look more comic booky to me. And I thought it would actually be nice for, for painting as well, because it could really grab, um, a wash when you put it over. But, uh, I wasn't painting a lot at the time, so I don't know if that was really the case. F I, I think it was probably more of a style thing for him, but it really, I really took it to heart, and I didn't like it when I first heard it. But uh, I did. But I did. Uh, as time went on, I've, you know, I practiced uh, being a little bit more judicious and, and choosy about when I really cut in a muscle detail. And I was glad that I that he pushed me to consider that and to try some different approaches because it really helped uh, make my sculpting more versatile. This next Magnificent Ego sculpt uh, is probably the wackiest one that I that I did, at least in the general concept. Maybe even more so than Horkia. But uh, this is Bear Ballsack, the Dwarf Gunslinger. And that's Bear, B-E-A-R, Ballsack. <laughs> Again, this is another D&D character one of the guys had. And uh, I really like doing dwarves at this time. This was, this was not a dwarf that I would normally do, but... It was a lot of fun. Um, again, he has some equipment that I never sculpted. These guns, little—I uh, don't know what you call them—little flintlock kind of pistols, but they got big, almost big blunderbuss style muskets and tiny little bayonet knives on there, so he can do melee fighting. But, uh, but again, they're two of the same thing, and I had no ability to cast them, so it took me a long time to recreate these and two of the exact same pistols to put in his hands uh, but I really like this guy I mean I've never done a miniature like him before or since uh, he's a single piece pose but he's pretty interesting and dynamic he's got some depth to him with how his head's protruding forward and the arms are going back uh, so he still casts up very nice and very well but 
you know, just a little different and, and interesting compared uh, to a lot of others I had done. This also gave me a lot more practice on figuring out how I would sculpt hair and beards, which could always be uh, a challenge when you're trying to put a lot of um, detail and, and um, strands of hair in there and cut it in. As you can see, I've really gotten much more comfortable with it. The, the lines on the hair, you don't see the kind of squishy wobbliness that my earlier pieces had where I would try and define lines and then I would go in there and then the putty would get squished into itself and I would, you would lose a lot of that detail. I was starting to get better about uh, cutting in braids and things like that. And overall, the, uh, the cl cleanness and sharpness of the detail in this, especially as a green stuff sculpt, um, for me, you know, this, these last three figures that I did for uh, Magnificent Egos, I, I, I was really hitting a stride. And f even though, you know, I know it took a long time to do each of these sculpts because of the way that I, uh, that I work doing a little bit at a time, I, I think I, I was in a bit of a zone and an understanding uh, of how to do this with green stuff, even though at the time I remember feeling like it was quite a struggle. This is the last miniature that I sculpted for Magnus and Egos in 2005, but this one's just a conversion. And I wasn't, I, I decided pretty early on when I was creating this list and maintaining like every miniature I ever sculpted that I was going to con count conversions because, you know, even though it's not a complete sculpt, it does create a new character, a new thing that would be out there that people would see and might know uh, me from. And it, took a lot of time to do these too, you know, maybe not quite as much as, an, as a full original. Uh, but this guy, this was a figure called Bull, and I basically had to do a weapon swap of him. Originally, I think he had like maybe a flaming sword in one hand and a hand crossbow in another. So I chopped those off and I was asked to, basically he was, he was swinging an anchor as a mace. Or, or a flail type of object in one hand and this giant two-handed hammer in the other. And even though, you know, it was just those two weapons, this was tough to do. This is a, this is a, was a larger miniature and the wet, and I, equipment was always a challenge for me. It just, I never liked sculpting highly precise items, you know, with lots of filing and things like that. And not only that, but the, the anchor had a chain, so I had to figure out how I would do a chain, uh, free flowing. You know, it's one thing to have it near or against the body; it's another to have it protruding out uh, with nothing to kind of hide half the detail or anything. So I did this really long process where I basically created a flat plane for the first set of the chain, where it would go, you know, one direction. You know, 90 degrees. Let's let's say, let's say left. You know, left to right, and then uh, cut in the chain elements. And then afterwards, I sculpted what you would might consider the top and bottom perpendicular links, and I sculpted each individual one on top of another, trying to make it meet in the center of the left to right links. Whew! It took a long time, and I think it looked okay, but um, definitely wasn't as uh, great as I had hoped. The last sculpts I did in 2005 was another first for me, and these were the Guerrilla Games Battle Station miniatures. These, this was a line of 15 millimeter miniatures designed to go with and work with uh, the Battle Stations board game by Jeff and Jason Sidek. And it's a super cool game. A lot of RPG elements, and uh, but but on a board where you can build your own ship. So kind of think of Star Trek, but but a little wackier, and um, it's just a ton of fun. Go check it out. They actually did a, a Kickstarter not too long ago, and they're selling it now of uh, the second edition of Battle Stations. But anyways, at the time, you know, the the uh, this version of the game, the new one's 28 millimeter, but this one was only 15 because uh, everything was much smaller to fit the board game and uh, 
I did something crazy on this line of figures. I actually started by sculpting kind of a base body for the races. I think there were six. There was human, the silicoid, which are like these rock guys, Kenoshans, Tentac, robots. I don't know. I don't remember exactly how many, but th there was a uh, several different aliens, Zalaxians. And uh, so I basically sculpted these base things, got them cast. This was the first time I got to do that. And they sent them back to me. And then I had to pose them up, which wasn't a problem on the aliens because of their body types. A lot of them were just masses of uh, material. There wasn't a lot to bend or flex. You just stick what you wanted on them weapon-wise. But the humans, that was a trick to be able to bend them into place. And, and you know, they looked a little bit sausagey. You know, I'll just say that kind of been rounded when when their arms would flex and stuff like that but there was a lot of miniatures to do and they wanted to keep the costs down and that was one way that I came up to do that um, I've never done a line of 15 millimeters figures since I've done a couple sculpts um, but that's really really all I ever did in that realm and it was fun it was neat to be sculpting uh, the aliens especially because they were so different and they offered some interesting challenges I'm really glad they were 15 even though that was tricky because they were so small it uh, it allowed me I was able to focus on the weirdness and difference uh, were in more of an easy approachable way whereas if I did them in 28 there would have had been so much more detail and I think it would have been more challenging to get the idea to come across because it would have to be so much more solid and, um, and uh, executed. Probably better than I was really able to at the time. I don't know, maybe I'm being too hard on myself. Sheesh, I sounded like I had a little bit of trepidation. I don't know why. Uh, but anyways, thanks so much for watching this episode of the Mini Sculpting Super Show. Leave your comments down below. I'd love to chat with you and let you uh, let me know what you thought of my early work. And if you have any questions, be happy to uh, read them and answer them. All right. Thanks again, and keep sculpting.